we keep mentioning Einstein. Tell us about Einstein. I mean, you know, everyone knows the images and everyone knows the myth, but what, what, would he, what was he really? And what did he add and what did he question? So Einstein was a smart cookie, as it turns out. <laughs> I, I think if anything, this is almost gonna sound silly, he's underrated. <laughs> okay. And he did win the person of the century and the whole bit. But we have this image of Einstein, you know, in the early 20th century with relativity. Um, you know, he came up with space time and then space time is curved and that's gravity, which eventually led other people to things like black holes and the Big Bang, and it's a big deal. And one of the fundamental things about gravity and general relativity is that it's more or less a one-man show. Einstein was the only guy who was really pushing on that and he figured it out. Mm. Whereas with quantum mechanics, it took 20 people, you know, years to, to really get this right, arguing with each other back and forth all the time. There's many different contributions from many different people, so you can't point to one person and give them the credit for quantum mechanics in the same way that you can give Einstein the credit for general relativity. So just for that reason alone, he deserves a lot of credit and he gets it. But then there's this story that you will hear that Einstein couldn't quite cope with quantum mechanics, right? So by the time quantum mechanics is put into its final form, it's around 1927. And there's this image of Einstein as an old man who can't quite keep up with the times. Now he was like 48 years old. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. so I don't wanna be told that he's an old man at the time, but also that image is wrong because Einstein understood quantum mechanics better than anybody, including the people who are given credit for inventing it. The difference is that he just wasn't willing to accept that it was done, that it was, you know, he wrote a famous paper, can the quantum mechanical description of reality be considered complete? He thought there was more to the story and we should keep looking. And I think he was right about that. I think that the stories that we were telling ourselves in the 1920s are woefully incomplete. So I do think that, you know, he had some ideas near the end of his life that turned out not to work, but we've all had ideas that turned out not to work. Uh, I think that his judgment was really, really good on these issues. Do you ever wonder how a guy in Switzerland on his own without laboratories came up with this? Or is it because it was a complete paradigm shift in a way of looking at things? I mean, do you ever think about that? Well, you know, Einstein had, in 1905, he had what is called his miracle year, where he has, you know, four different papers published in the same journal, any one of which should have won the Nobel Prize. And we do think about that, how in the world that happened. He was not even a professor at the time. He was a patent clerk, right? And maybe you can say, well, being the patent clerk gave him more free time because, you know, it was not a very difficult job. It was enough, enough to pay the rent, basically. Um, but no, you know, somehow he had this way of figuring out exactly which parts of the phenomena were relevant and which parts were irrelevant, which parts you could throw away and which parts you could keep. In fact, his first major contribution to relativity, there's special relativity that is all the business about the speed of light being constant and the clocks and so forth. Uh, that's 1905, and then it was 10 years later, 1915, that he says, well, maybe this space time is curved and you get gravity. Special relativity was not just Einstein. He was building on things that other people did. In fact, his major contribution was to say, we can simplify everything. There was this idea, there was the ether, this invisible field that filled all of space, right. and light was propagating through the ether. And it took Einstein just to say, if you remove the word ether here everywhere, and you just say light propagates through empty space, you get all of the phenomena correctly described in much simpler terms. All you have to do is give up on the idea that there's an absolute space and an absolute time, which is a lot to give up on. And he was just a genius at giving up on the right things. Hmm. Wow, and that's, that, that probably is, is, is the history of great movements in human technology and understanding, people who know what to look at and people that can also walk away from previous assumptions. You know, it's fascinating to me because there's no one right way to be a great physicist. There are different physicists who have very different styles. Just at Caltech, where I am, in the 1960s, we had both Richard Feynman and Murray Gelman, uh, who were the best theoretical physicists in the world at the time, but very, very different styles. And styles come along with different you know, predispositions, different feelings, different intuitions about how nature is going to work. And the dirty little secret of theoretical physics is that it's not an algorithm. There's not a way to go from the data to the correct, to the correct story. You're gonna guess, you're gonna say, well, maybe it's this way, maybe it's that way. 
different people will make different guesses, and in different historical circumstances, different guesses are going to turn out right. Like Einstein in 1905 made all the right guesses. His intuition was spot on again and again. And then when it came to, you know, the 1930s and 40s, when he was trying to unify gravity with electromagnetism, all of his guesses were wrong. And he didn't become dumber, you know. Uh, it was just a different time and different problems were ripe for being solved at that time.